Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I don't know about you, but this is my Christmas because if he didn't rise, we've got nothing to celebrate. So Jesus is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. And welcome everybody to come and celebrate this day with us. We are so glad you are here. We would love to, love it if you can hang around. Oh, my name's Kerry, by the way. And we would love it if you can hang around afterwards for a little bit of morning tea. But we also understand if you want to go off and party some. Somewhere. We get that as well. But try and have a little bit of nibble with us would be good. Um, also, um, here at Lighthouse, we have different ways that you can connect. And if you want to know about all the different things that we've got on, please check out our website, QR code there if you need it. Um, but there are some highlights of some events that we've got coming up. This Thursday, we have our monthly prayer meeting. The Hour of Power here at Lighthouse. So come and join us where we, we just storm heaven and just pray for our community, for our nation and for whatever else the Holy Spirit tells us. Also on Friday, it's party time for the youth. Ignite Youth is on this Friday. Um, so if you want more information about that, apparently they're having a fantastic time. They think I'm not... They think I'm too old for youth, but I don't think I am. But I haven't been able to get an invite yet, so I'll see what I can do. Um, also, this month is our discipleship training month. So our first session is next Sunday, and it goes from 1 till 2. It's in this um, venue here. It's just an hour of discipleship training, and we're focusing on relationships this month. And so next Sunday will be how to have is it strong relationships. Um, also, we um, partner with, with different churches overseas and there's a mission update on our website. Thank you very much, Mr. Rob Perrett, for getting that up there and giving us such a great oversight last week on how we're going with our partners overseas. Um, so if you would like to give, we've got an upcoming mission trip to um, Thailand and Cambodia and some projects that go along with that. If you would like to give to that, they're the details that you can give into the upcoming mission trip and the upcoming projects overseas. And if you can't give financially, guess what, guys? We can all give in prayer. So please be praying for our team as they go overseas because when we go on our knees, we don't have to get visas, but we go as well. So please be praying. Also, if this place is your home church, if this is where God has placed you, where you can grow and become all that you can be in Him, then we have a way of actually worshipping Him by having the opportunity to give financially. So if this is your home church, this is how you can give your offerings online. That's the details. Or if you like, you can put them in the baskets over there, whichever way. We don't care. We take cash. We take online. We take everything. Because guess what? It all belongs to Him anyway. So thank you, Lord. Let's worship Jesus. Yeah, can we all stand up? Take this time to greet one another. Give a person a high five. Say, Jesus is alive. Happy Resurrection Day. Our King is alive. Give a person a hug. Yeah. The love of Jesus is in this place. He is alive. Thank you, Jesus. For all that you've done, Lord, we praise you. The King of Kings. Hallelujah. I would sing this. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same because you came near from the everlasting to the well we live, the Father's only Son. Woo! You lived and you died, you rose again on high, you've all 
Jesus, we praise the resurrected King. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross to show your great love to your children, to us. Thank you, Jesus.
robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce and Sing that one more time. On Jesus' face, he shall return. Oh, he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze trans. I just want us to partake of communion this morning. We weren't sure if we we're going to have communion. We had it on Good Friday, but how many you know it's always a good time to celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus, to remember and honor Him. In our loudness, the book of Psalms, very explicit about praise and worship before the Lord. There's loudness, there's shouting, there's trumpets, there's mu music happening. But it's just as powerful and just as spiritual as the t times where we reflect in silence and remember what Jesus actually did for us. Yeah. And communion is one of those moments, I believe, not that it has to be somber all the time, but when we pause and remember and say, Lord, you spilt your blood, you shed your blood on the cross for me. Your body was beaten for me, not for you, for me. You were God in the flesh, taking on the sins of the world. So I want to read a passage of Scripture as the elements get passed around. And this in your own way, honour Jesus' sacrifice to you personally this morning. Sometimes we get lost in, yes, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. I heard, I've heard it often said that if you were the only person on the earth alive, 
Jesus would have come just for you. Such is the extravagant and the lavishness of the love of God. It's unconditional, poured out freely for all of us. I read a scripture in the first Corinthians. It says, Paul says here, writing to the Corinthian church in chapter 11, verse 23, for I received from the Lord, interesting Paul's, I received from the Lord. Paul never met Jesus in the flesh. He met him after the resurrection. He was a post-resurrection apostle. What I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, these are Jesus' words for all of us this morning. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he says, in, this, in, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Thank you. Just, thank you. For then he goes on to say, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So not only is it a, a moment of reflection and honouring as we're going to partake of the, the bread and the juice this morning, I believe it's a prophetic declaration that as we take communion, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until He returns. We're saying, Jesus, You died for us. You paid the ultimate price for us. And we do this to remember You and look forward that one day you will return, bring us safely home into the Father's house. Can you say amen? amen? So if you can partake of the wafer with me this morning, in your own word, just thank the Lord for His broken body for you. stripes, Lord, we are healed. Partake of the bread this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that as we drink of the juice this morning, symbolic of your blood, we thank you that this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for us for the remission of our sin, Lord. We do this in remembrance of you this morning, Lord. Proclaim your, your death. We stand on your word, your finished work. So you died, you rose again. And Lord, we thank you that one day either we, you will take us home or you will return. And for that, Lord, we are eternally grateful. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're going to do one more song. Worship to the Lord.
final breath he gave as heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war and death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now death where is your
Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We honor you. We reverence your name. We worship you. We come with fear in our hearts before you, Lord. We pray, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done today on earth as it is in heaven. I wonder if you can join me just to pray 
for our city this morning. Heavenly God's interested in every church, in every person that's alive, not just in Sydney, but across the nations. And there's a scripture that says, as we lift Jesus on high, as we exalt Him, as we preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit will draw people unto Himself, unto the, the finished work of the cross. You join me today in praying for the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of who Jesus is and what He's done in every church across our city. As the gospel's been preached, the churches that look different, sound different to us, but the gospel's been preached. Can you say amen? Jesus is being celebrated and glorified in churches across our city. So Father, we join with the prayers of the saints, your children across our city. And we lift up the name of Jesus over the city of Sydney, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that as your gospel is preached, Holy Spirit, that you'll bring repentance unto salvation. You'll bring faith unto salvation and confession of the Lordship of Jesus. That because your church gathered this morning, that many, many men, women, teenagers and children will be snatched out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your glorious Son. And we thank you and we rejoice in celebrating what you're doing across our city. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Please be seated. While we're in the mood of applauding and giving thanks, let's thank the team this morning. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And not just that team, let's thank the team at the back that we often don't see. And the team that comes early to set up, let's thank them as well. <laughs> the team that cleans the toilets, makes your coffee, looks after our children. <laughs> Come on, how many know we're all part of the A team? Not that we're Mr. T. And some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but you know, some of the older people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That uh, whether we got the mic in our hands or whether we're pushing a button at the back or we're picking up a bit of rubbish around the building, how many of you know we all serve Jesus? And we're just as needed, just as valuable because we all are His sons and daughters. We're all His children. And though man tries to elevate other men, I think it's in our fallen human nature that we want to exalt other human beings. God's very... Very clear, he's not going to share his glory with anyone. And uh, even though we have different functions, there's no, I believe, the New Testament's very, there's no hierarchy in the church. There's no clergy and laity in the church. And I don't know why I'm saying all this, but I just want to be honest and truthful that the way we lead the church, we want to model that we're all on the same page in terms of we're all sons and daughters. There's no stepping stone. There's no, you're here and I'm here and, we serve you. No, we, serve, we all serve Jesus. Amen. Just that my role, it might be different to your role, but your role is just as needed as my role. And if we all can take ownership of that, then we're going to count and we're going to serve Jesus and none of us are going to get upset because you're not serving me, so I'm going to let you down, yeah? Probably before I speak any, 30 more seconds, I'm going to let you down, okay? <laughs> not that I want to, but it's just we're not perfect. There's only one that's perfect. His name is Jesus. And I love the fact that we can, not only in the church, because some of us, and praise God, we all should be help, helping and serving in the local church. I believe it's biblical. It's, it's a way that we express worship and community. But we all have, also have ministries outside the church. And to be honest, the ministry outside the church is probably more important than the ministry inside the church. I don't, I don't know exactly theologically where I sit with that. But how many know if we're all saved, praise God, that's fantastic. We're all born in believers. That's great. And we can sing and we can experience God and we can have freedom and we can do all those things, but none of, no one outside the building is going to get impacted. I just want to remind us this Easter, yes, we're coming to celebrate and remember what Jesus did. But if Jesus is real in your heart, then Easter is for you every day. Because every day you're celebrating and you're full of joy and peace because your Savior died for you, and you can't wait to tell people about Jesus. 
Not necessarily to bring them to a meeting. Please keep bringing your friends to meetings. That's cool, right? But the kingdom doesn't advance when people come and sit on the seat on a Sunday morning. The kingdom of God advances when people respond to the truth of who Jesus is. And he's going to use you and me to get the truth out there. Can you say amen? Now, I'm not grumpy this morning. I'm so happy this morning. I love the Lord. I love you guys. And, and it's, so, it's good to see so many new faces. And if you're, if you're new and you're visiting, please hang around. We'd love to get to know you. But we, we want to make much about Jesus this morning, as every morning we gather. Because if it's not about Jesus, we've got nothing to give you. I'm sorry. I don't have any tricks up my sleeve. It's not my message. It's not my words. It's not my experiences. It's Christ and Him crucified. Amen. It's Jesus and the resurrected glory of His presence that gives life and gives hope and touches your hearts and empowers you to live for Him. Can you say amen? amen. I'm going to stop talking because I'm going to get into preaching and it's going to be too long. I'm going to ask Alessia, where is she? Let's welcome Alessia. <laughs> Alessia and Jack have two beautiful children. They're serving the Lord. But I just wanted to share on this Resurrection Sunday, and Alessia felt stirred on her heart to share a little bit of a testimony. Because we you know Jesus was raised from the dead. Not so we can have something to say, is that that He can change our lives. He can transform us by His power and make us new creations in Christ. So most of us here in this room, I believe, we have some type of understanding of what that is. But those of us who are praying for loved ones, sisters, brothers, uncles, aunties, grandparents, children, grandchildren, neighbors, Sometimes we, we lose hope because we think, Lord, how long, O oh Lord, must I pray? How long, O oh Lord, until they turn to you? And uh, just Alicia's going to share a little bit of her story just to give us hope that if God can reach someone like Alicia, He can reach anyone, honestly. <laughs> and I mean that with all due respect. Yeah. <laughs> it's because I always say this. Uh, hi, my name is Alicia, and like two weeks ago, I really felt on my heart that God want to share my um, testimony of my salvation. And I believe it's for the people, like Jim says, who believe for the loved ones, and you think, I invite them to church, they're not coming, or how they ever going to come to Christ. And I just want to share my uh, testimony, how I get saved. So 10 years ago, I came to Australia, um, and I live between two countries, America and Australia, I travel a lot. Um, Ten years before, I live in America, and I live very wild, crazy life in the world. Last three years of my life, I live in Las Vegas. Wild parties, drinking, um, just very dark life. And while I was traveling between uh, Australia and America, I was reading the books. And I was getting to the point of my life, I was thinking, while I'm here, what I'm doing, what is the life about? I never dream about to have a children or be married or... I was thinking, why I'm here? And um, one day in the evening, I googled the most spiritual book. And book came up and it was called Power Thoughts and something 12 strategies to meditate on it or something. So I ordered this book. And I start to read. And when I start to read, I realize it's a Christian book. It was Joyce Meyer book. And I start to read the book. So because all referrals to the Bible, and uh, I grew up in Russia after Soviet Union. So I never heard the gospel. I know people celebrate Christmas, Easter, but who Jesus is, it's like, you know, some people believe in Buddha, some people believe in Jesus. I didn't know anything about so I ordered the Bible um, on her website, and um, I was going through a lot of my personal stuff with my previous, previous marriage. And one day I was sitting on the floor, and I was crying, and I was thinking what I'm doing, and I was over of the fights with my ex-husband. And I remember something about Jesus in the Bible. So I bring the Bible, I open the Bible, and in the end of the Bible was prayer of salvation, but I didn't know it's prayer of salvation. 
So I start to read, I read three times, like, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you're son of God, and I repent for my sin, and I really start to, from my heart, repenting of my sins. Brilliant. And I start to cry, and I say, like, Lord, I can't, like, come to my life, be Lord and my Savior. Like, I have no head knowledge, you know, I just read the prayer of salvation, but I, I believe what it was said. And presents come to my room, and everything silence around me. And first time in my life I experienced that what the Bible says, peace that surpasses all understanding. And I remember I'm looking and I'm like, what is happening? What is happening? But from that moment, I knew it. Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. I, I start to daily read the Bible and hearing God. I went to one church in the beginning and tried to tell my experience, but look like church was very religious, and it says like, oh, we don't hear God. And I decided to be on my own for the first two years. I was just me and the Holy Spirit, and believing what the Word says, I was filled with the Holy Spirit of speaking in tongues. At home, without church, God set me free from the alcohol, from smoking a pack and a half cigarette a day just in overnight. It was gone, alcohol was gone, all addictions was gone, and I just want to encourage for people like who believe for the loved ones, this is the real resurrection power. Jesus says who he is, and he is true, and he is living, and every word in Bible is true. As I said, I have no church, but I have the Holy Spirit, and I believe the word of God. If it's God says you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, it's for everyone. If it's Bible says whoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be delivered. Everyone can call on the Lord, help being delivered. So I just want to encourage to everyone who believe for the loved one, just keep praying and trust God. It's, if it's God can save every, like person like me who lives in a chain, in the darkness, in addiction, and set me free and make me alive and on fire for God, He can save everyone. Thank you, Lord. To you be Jesus all glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So good. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Come on. Come on. Jesus is alive. He's alive to set us free. He's here to break the chains. He's here to set us free from sin, from darkness, from chains that hold us back. And I'm going to ask the guys at the back if you can go to my message, but go to the very last slide. I want to start with the end, because this is where we want to get to. So, so one before that, one before that. There we go. Thank you. In my head, it's the last slide. It's not your fault, Tim. It's in my head. So we want to get to a point where you, and I'm going to try and equip you today as a minister of the gospel, because we're all ministers of the new covenant, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that we're armed with truth to help Bring the gospel to where people are at. Because not every person you meet is ever going to come into a church to hear the gospel. But you can be the gospel, for want of a better word, dispenser. <laughs> you can be the gospel bringer of good news everywhere you go. And there's three things that are very important in any gospel presentation. The ABC. Anyone can remember it. Do, all, do we all know the ABCs, yeah? A, we need to get the people to get to, to a realization to admit that they're sinners. So unless someone knows that they're a sinner, they're unright before God. It's not your job to point their sins out, by the way. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin and last time I checked, you weren't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so admit. How do we get people to admit? It's a very simple test. When you're in a conversation, most Aussies will say, if you ask them, if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? I don't know the actual statistics. But most Aussies, over 70%, would say, I'd go to heaven. And if you ask them why, they'd say, this is the number one response. I'm not such a bad person. And if that's the response, 
you've got them. <laughs> because all you need to get them to admit, if you've sinned once in your whole life, guess what? You're a sinner. I was a sinner. And now we're saints. We're getting to that. Thank you, Sue. But we, we're sometimes we're too quick, and I'm not having a go at you, Sue. I'm just sometimes we're too quick to bring the good news without diagnosing the problem first. When you go to the doctor, what does he say? Hey, where does it hurt? Where's your problem? He doesn't just prescribe you antibiotics. Well, he shouldn't just prescribe you antibiotics. Or he or she shouldn't if they're a good doctor. They're trying to diagnose the problem. Why? Because there's a specific thing you need to do for that diagnosis. Diagnosis of all humanity. We're all sinners. Now, it doesn't matter what that person says to you. Because they can say, no, I've never sinned. Well, you just sinned right now by saying you've never sinned. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, you leave it to them. That's right. Don't get into fights. Yeah. Don't get into proving. Jesus came to save sinners. I put my hand up. I am, was a sinner. Step two, you bring the cross. Believe. There has to be a transaction of faith. It's not just saying a prayer. And, and, I get, and I'm not having a go at Alicia. I, I, I fully support her decision, what she did. But at some point, the heart has to believe. And that, the Bible says, is a gift of God anyway. <laughs> so you need to give them something to do. Because faith is a doing word. It's an action. James says faith without works is half dead. Is that what he said? No. Faith without works is completely dead. And I get it that we're saved by faith and faith alone. 100% we'll keep preaching that until Jesus returns. There's nothing but faith that saves us. But faith is a response to the heart that believes the gospel. And faith says, I let go in, in the same... So if repentance and faith are uh, two sides of the one coin. Because as you repent, you're letting go. And as you believe, you're grabbing a hold of. You're letting go of your dead works. And you're grabbing a hold of the finished works of Jesus. Very simple. Are you following so far? Yes. I'm arming you to be gospel ambassadors everywhere you go. And if we can mobilize the church to preach the gospel every day of every moment... How many of you know our, our effect for the gospel in the kingdom is exponential? Because it's not just one day a week we preach the gospel. Every day, every week, we're setting people out in their mission field in Sydney. How many of you know you're all missionaries in Sydney? Yeah. You maybe never went to Bible school. You maybe never got qualified. But you and you and you and you and you and you and you are all missionaries in Sydney. No amens. Far out. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. And next comes the confession. That's where the prayer comes in. But don't too, be too quick to pray a sinner's prayer with someone. Because we're not just making converts. We're making disciples. People need to understand what they're saying yes to. We're asking them to lay their whole life down for Jesus. Not we are. Jesus is asking them. We're asking them to say, say a life of no to self and yes to Jesus. And we can't water that down. We can't just say, come to Jesus, your life's going to be good. That's a lie. Come to Jesus, he's going to resurrect your dead spirit. You're going to have eternal life. But it's going to cost you everything. That's the gospel. <laughs> Who wants to buy into that gospel? Well, it's not, a, it's not a self, it's not a me thing. The Holy Spirit reveals truth to me of who Jesus is and what he's done. And then I say, yes, with revelation and faith, not just following someone or something. Does that make sense? That's where I want to end. We're going to use some scriptures to help us. So you're in this room this morning. I'm trusting you're here by your own volition your own free will, you haven't been forced by someone to be here. So you've come into a church building, you've come into a service, a Resurrection Sunday service, you're here to hear the gospel this morning. So you are a receptive audience as far as I'm concerned. 
Because we're not out there on the street saying who wants to listen. You've come into here. Put your hand up if you're here to hear the gospel this morning. Wonderful. And while you're here, Holy Spirit's working on your heart. And it's just not just for those out there, it's for you. Because I believe that as believers, we grow in our revelation of the gospel. We should be. Because the enemy wants to obscure the finished work of the gospel. He said to the, to the Galatian church, who has bewitched you, in other words, cast a spell over you, that you should not obey the truth. He said, I clearly portrayed Jesus as crucified among you, Galatians 3, but you've turned away from that to follow some other stuff. You want to add to the already perfected, finished work of Jesus. And Paul's saying, you've been bewitched. Who's he writing to? Not the unsaved, to the church. So we need to, I've said this often, preach the gospel to ourselves first when you wake up in the morning. Not that you need to get saved every morning, but you need to thank the Lord for the finished work of the cross. So you can live in the freedom of what Jesus purchased for you. Making sense? Are we all good? Can we take a deep breath? Awesome. Right now I'm starting my clock, and no, I'm joking. <laughs> I better get, 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 anyway, moving on, moving on. Let's go back to the very first slide, and we're going to jump through here and there, and we're not going to take very long. Jesus is alive. Can you say amen? The true message of Easter. I'm going to read a statement here, and it's uh, by the name of Lyle Rollins. He was, and he made this statement. He said, the greatest man in history is Jesus. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He did not live in a castle, yet they called him lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him king. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. Do you know him? <laughs> Come on, the greatest man. Jesus split time in two. When Jesus was born, and obviously it's not 100% accurate in terms of his, his birth, but Jesus came and it was back in the old days, BC and AD, now they've changed it. But the concept's the same. Jesus came to split and to bring a revelation of who God is, who the Father is. And he did that by modeling what it looks like to live with the Father in a relation with Him, full of the Spirit, but also did that by going to the cross and, and paying the ultimate price with His life to bring us safely to Him. Now, Augustine of Hippo, have you heard of Augustine of Hippo? He's one of the early church fathers. And I love this, because sometimes we feel pressure in our modern society to have to defend our truth all the time. And we get into arguments, and we get into stuff, and I get it, and some people, uh, they need to, to, to know that intellectually and, and mentally, they need to know the truth, and we all do, but Jesus doesn't need any help. The Word of God doesn't need your help to make it real. <laughs> we don't need to mansplain the Bible. And I love this, because this, Augustine said, the truth is like a lion, you do not need to defend it. Let it loose, it will defend itself. Our job is to speak truth. Don't get into stuff. And of course, if people are asking questions, you want to give them your opinion, or well, this is what I think. But we don't have to explain the Bible. The Bible will explain itself. The Holy Spirit brings, as we heard with Alessia, brings to light the words that you read. The Bible is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible is a seed. The Word of God is a seed that gets planted in your heart. When you believe it, it begins to germinate, and it makes you to become born again. The Bible is so powerful. It's incorruptible seed. Our job is just to sow the seed. Jesus said it often. A farmer sows the Word. Go out there and sow the seed and watch it produce. 
Watch it increase. Watch it bring the kingdom to people's lives. Amen. How many excited to sow God's word? And there's many ways in our day and age, obviously, and, and without having to be even spiritual, you can use these things called mobile phones, and they're smartphones, but they're not that smart, right? They're quite hard. <laughs> but we can use media. Why do we leave the media for the devil to use it? And all the junk that comes that pollutes our kids' minds and all this. Let's use it for the word. Let's sow seeds through the multimedia, through the social, not multimedia, social media. Let's converse around the word. Let's talk around the word. Around our families, in our connect groups, around people, let's talk the word. Why? Because the word has power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Let's move a little quicker. Matthew 27, verse 27. The true message of Easter this morning. We're going to look at what Jesus accomplished. Matthew 27, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, the king of the Jews. Then they spat on him. Then they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. If you have a question, does God really love me? Jesus did that not for himself. Jesus, fully God, fully man, went to the cross on purpose. And it was necessary for him to suffer in our place, to be mocked, to be spat upon, to be beaten, to be his flesh ripped open, his beard plucked off his face. The folk, I just want us to focus on the crown of thorns. They put a crown of thorns on him, again in mockery, because they'll bowing down, making fun of him, hail the king of the Jews, and they put a crown of thorns. The crown of thorns vividly symbolized the curse of sin being placed on Jesus' head. Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Abraham sinned in the garden. Sorry, did I say Abraham? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Adam sinned in the garden and he was banished with his wife from the garden. And the father said to him, you're going to, by the sweat of your brow and, and the, the, the earth's going to produce thorns and thistles. In other words, sin has cursed the planet now. Sin has cursed your life. Sin isn't just a little bit wrong. Sin brings death, the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. Sin's ultimate goal is to bring death to you, as was evidenced in the garden. And through that act of disobedience, Adam cursed the whole planet and the generations to come after him. So every person born after Adam and Eve is born in the curse, because he was the instigator of the curse. And Jesus, see, no detail in the Bible is insignificant. And these soldiers didn't even know what they were doing. They didn't know they were acting out a prophetic declaration that Jesus, the sinless, spotless lamb, 
It was to take away the sins of the world by becoming a curse for us on the tree. And in mockery, God still has his way. And Jesus as our king. I wonder if we can have the crown that was spinning around before. I don't know if it's possible there. The crown of thorns. Every prick a reminder of your sin and my sin. Every prick a reminder that God sent his one and only son to take the full penalty of our sin. Every prick a reminder that without the shedding of blood there cannot be remission of sin. Every prick a reminder of the love the Father has for you, that he allowed his one and only son to be so punished, not for him, for us. And Isaiah beautifully sums it up. I mean, the whole book of Isaiah is written, some theologians say 700, 800 BC. And God gave Isaiah such revelation of what happened on the cross. It says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment for our peace was upon him. Our peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Can you say amen? Amen. And then in John 19 it says that, verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, He gave up his spirit. So that's very intentional because Jesus wasn't necessarily murdered on the cross. He gave up his spirit on the cross. Very important. Because it was a free will offering before the Lord. And that word for finished in the Greek is a very complicated word. I won't even try and pronounce it even though I am Greek. Because it's a compound word and it's, it has the idea of being perfectly complete and completely perfect. In other words, every way you look at the cross, it's perfectly complete and completely perfect. In other words, it's eternal. No one can add to it. It is finished when Jesus said, and nothing and no one can take the power of the cross away. Can you say amen? And then we know the story that we celebrate this morning, Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary, Magdalene, and the other Mary came to, uh, came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. I would have loved to see this, right? <laughs> Imagine going. And this great earthquake happens, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. And he sat on it. I love that. It was like a cool angel. No, I'm joking. He's like, he's like no, I'm joking. He's sat on it. I don't want to take that away. Sorry, Lord. But check this out. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Just be careful. Sometimes we use language too flippantly. Some people say, I've seen an angel and I can see an angel there. And I get it. We can see into the spirit realm, but if an angel really appears, like appears, we're all going to know about it. Cool? These on the floor, guards smashed by the glory of an angel, like dead men. But the angel said to them and to the women, do not be afraid. That's the first response anytime an angel appears. Do not be afraid. Because when you see an angel, you're going to have a. (laughs) Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. 
Kerry, you read this in the prayer meeting, didn't you? Yeah, awesome. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I've told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. I love that. <laughs> In other words, they, they were freaking out. These angels talking to them, sitting on a, Jesus is not there. They're sitting on the rock. The glory of the angel, they're full of fear. But at the same time, they just heard the most incredible news. Jesus is alive. So full of fear, but also full of joy at the same time. I don't know how that makes sense, but it's in the Bible, okay? And, and they ran to bring his disciples the word. Wonderful. I'm going to say this morning, Jesus is alive. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus is alive. Yeah. We've got to move a little quicker. So you see... Understanding and living in the finished work of, of, of the cross, that Jesus is alive, is where God wants us to camp. It should be our default position in life as believers, our true north, our anchor needs to be Christ and Him crucified. Come on, the old hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. It's still true today. If we're not grounded upon the gospel, we are like rudderless ships trying to navigate through the storms of life with no fixed point, no compass, no bearing on our direction, no bearing on life. Well, how are we going to get to where God wants us to be? And I believe as we preach the gospel, as we declare the finished work of Jesus, faith is a byproduct of hearing the gospel. And faith begins by hearing and trusting the gospel. God paid the price for your freedom 2,000 years ago in Christ. Christianity does not begin with something you do, but something that has been done for you. Amen. Jesus has finished all the work by perfectly and completely redeeming us. Amen. Our response is we simply believe and live in the gospel. Amen. And we believe it. It humbles us because you know you did nothing to earn your position in God. You did nothing to earn forgiveness. You did nothing to earn right standing and righteousness. You did nothing to earn this bold entrance into the throne of grace before our King. So it doesn't make us judgmental. It doesn't make us uh, pointing fingers at people's sin. It makes us so grateful that we freely can share the good, good news everywhere we go. Can you say Amen. I've got a couple of quick points and we're done. Point number one, we need to understand the gospel. I mentioned it earlier. We always need to start with the problem. And I get evangelists, they want us just to make decisions. And I'm, I'm not anti-evangelism. We need to have evangelists. They stir the church up to mobilize us. But with all due respect to every evangelist, past, present, and future, Jesus never said to make decisions. And we go to meetings and we fill out cards and because you fill out a card and you said a prayer, now you're saved. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> so the proof of you being born again is not that you fill out a card. Is that the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that, that now you're a child of God. Amen. Your spirit becomes alive. As with Alicia, she started reading the Bible. Number one fruit, are you born again? You start reading the Bible. I've read the Bible before as a Christian. I couldn't understand one word. The moment I got saved, the, actually that, that night, I gave my heart to Jesus, born again. I went home, where's the Scriptures? Number two proof, you're born again, is a fellowship of believers. We forget about this truth. When we come together, you're, you're part of a body. You've been united together with a local body, but also the greater body. It's not just a decision. Now you are part of a family. <laughs> That's number one, two fruit that you're born again. You want to belong somewhere. 
Come on, someone please say amen, okay? <laughs> and again, very vivid for me. My sister, she's probably watching it on YouTube. Mary, let's be praying for her. She's got a, a very ba- bad knee. She cracked a kneecap. Um, let's be praying for her. Anyway, she's an evangelist, I believe. She loves telling people about Jesus. She didn't invite us to everything the church was doing. We weren't Christians at the time. And I just, for the sake of just annoying, we, we used to turn up to stuff. <laughs> but God had a plan. But before we got saved, one time I remember very vividly, we went to Luna Park and we kind of got tricked. I thought it was just her and us, but she invited all her church friends. <laughs> and I'm thinking, who are these bunch of loonies? I don't want anything to do with you. And I vividly remember telling my sister, okay, you guys go this way and we're going to go this way because as for me, we want to mix with these weird Christians. The moment I got born again, I didn't have to read it. I didn't have to. My heart changed. I knew you're my brothers and sisters. I'd run to every meeting. I'd hug everything that moved. Still do. Why? Because my heart came born again. (laughs) How do I get onto that, Maria? It's Tim's fault at the back. His hat distracted me. I love your hat, Timmy. Problem we've covered. Solution. God's solution. God knew we could not approach him, so he sent his one and only son to earth as a human, fully human, fully God, as our substitute, as a perfect sinless offering for our sin, and died in our place on the cross. Three days later, after fully paying for all man's sins for all time, we've got to know that. What Jesus did was once and for all. <laughs> Jesus was raised from the dead as the victorious Son of God, as Romans 1 alludes to, forever securing our access into the kingdom of God, whereby now we can approach God with freedom. And confidence. Can you say amen? And that scripture there is so powerful. When God, but God, who, rich, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Can you say amen? Amen. The problem, mankind is dead, spiritually dead without God. We're on a road to irreversible, eternal punishment without Him. Just so we're clear, God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose to reject Christ. Jesus has paid for the salvation of every human through all time for all eternity. And that's the message we need to get out because they all need to hear it so they can believe it. Turn to the person next to you, say, it's all on you. It's all on you. It's all on you. Next is eternal. We're almost done. The gospel is eternal. And sometimes we take the eternity out of the gospel. We just want to give people some peace and forgiveness for this life. Come, God will forgive your sins away. He'll wash you white as snow. And I get that. Psalm 103, my favorite psalm. He forgives us all our sins (laughs) as far the east is from the west. But it's only part of the gospel. (laughs) You see, Jesus saved us, he's saving us now, and he will save us in eternity. That's the gospel. It's not a one-dimensional gospel. 
It's a 3D gospel. Past, present, and future. Amen. Hebrews 9, 12 says, He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Just on that, I'm going to, one scripture, and then we're going to finish with another point. The resurrection from the dead. Paul says in Romans 8, let me read it. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up till the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Focus, follow the train of thought here. For he says, in this hope we were saved. He says, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. What's Paul saying there? Saying part of the gospel is our eternal salvation. Is our resurrection from the dead of our physical bodies. That's part of the gospel. I didn't make it up. It's in there. And Paul says, we're groaning inwardly. We're waiting for this day to come because one day we're going to be set free from this groaning because we're going to receive the hope we're waiting for, the resurrection of our bodies. See, I I can't remember the last time I heard a gospel presentation including the resurrection of your body for the future. I can't remember. I'm not saying it's me. I just can't remember. Because we make it all about the here and now. (laughs) So one day, if you know you're going to get resurrected, you're going to have tremendous patience to deal with anything that comes your way. It stirs you up for patience and good works because you know one day, One day I'm going to be resurrected in glory. Can you say amen? And Paul says it many times in his writings. Philippians 3 says, Our citizenship is not from heaven, but we are eagerly await a Savior from there, who one day by the power that enables Him, He will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like His glorious body. Can you say amen? Hebrews says this, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so in Christ, so so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear the sin, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. Can you say amen? So the gospel is yes, now we can enjoy freedom, relationship with God, our sins are forgiven, but it's not just for now, it's for eternity. So that's why we're told to patiently endure things. That's why we're told in this world you're going to have trouble. That's why we're told don't focus on this earthly stuff. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Because this life is not a full stop. It's a comma. We go into the next life. Let's be ready to face this next life. Can you say amen? I just had to interrupt myself there very quickly. It's part of the gospel. Let's look at just three quick things now. Last point, understanding the gospel, a new identity. So when you and I got born again, 2 Corinthians says that we, the old things have passed away. We Behold, all things have become new. We are new creations in Christ. I'm not just a different person. I'm a new kind of person in Christ. It's not just God put band-aids on me and fixed me up and just wiped the blood off my nose and said, okay, keep going. No, I've got a whole new identity on the inside of me. I became born again. Can you say amen? This is part of the gospel. Well, Jim, my life hasn't changed much in the last few few years, months, whatever, fill in the, the blanks. Well, sometimes we don't see the change or the progress in our lives. And sometimes we get discouraged. But let me encourage you that the change happens on the inside, not on the outside. 
Paul says, even though outwardly I'm wasting away, inwardly I'm being renewed day by day. That's what Paul says. So the transformation starts on the inside of you, and it's making its way on the outside of you. But we're a work in progress. We never arrive at perfection. We are changing. God's Spirit lives on the inside of us because we have a new identity. Now, some of the things that I've discovered in my life, that the enemy is a liar. The Bible says, Jesus said about him, that he's the father of lies. That everything coming out of the enemy's mouth and his condemnation and intimidation, he wants to bring lies. He wants you to think that you're stuck in your sin. He wants you to think there's no hope for you. You've done that sin millions of times. God's not going to forgive you. It's a lie because I've got a new identity. Because of the finished work of Jesus, Jesus saves me from my sin. And he saves me in a threefold way. He saves me from the penalty of sin. He saves me from the power of sin. And he's going to save me from the presence of sin. The penalty of sin Jesus took on the cross for you and for me. He took your and my place. We never have to pay for our sins ever again. Agree. Please say amen. amen. <laughs> so I'm saved from the penalty of sin. Would you agree? Yes. Now I'm being saved. It's a continual process from the power of sin. Yes. How many of you have stopped sinning completely since you've become born again? Thank you. Does that mean we're not saved? No, it doesn't. Our sinful nature, the Bible says, when you're born again, is cut off, cut away, circumcised. When we're made new, born again, now there's the remnants of the sinful nature. We need to, with Jesus' help by His Spirit, get victory over the power of sin on this earth. And that's where the enemy lies. He tells you that sin is more powerful than the finished work of Jesus, and it's a lie. <laughs> so what do you do when you're tempted to sin? You bring your sin to Jesus. Don't run away from Jesus. He loved you so much, He wants to help you through your sin. So He saves us from the power of sin, present day. Then one day, we're in glory. He's going to save us permanently from the presence of sin. And can you say amen? So you've had a brand new identity shift. That's why I don't call myself a sinner saved by grace. I get the sentiment, but it's not. Because that to me is like band-aid, band, I'm a sinner. I'm still a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. No, I was a sinner. I'm saved by grace. Now I'm born again. I can live in the victory of Jesus. I'm a saint. And all those things. Satan, some, the enemy lies to us that he's still in control of your life. Bad things still happen to you because stuff. I don't know. Yes, the enemy's real. He's the prince of power of the air. But Satan is under Jesus' feet, yeah? He is the name above every name. I don't have to listen to his lies. We don't belong to his kingdom anymore. <laughs> Living in his darkness was native to our pre-born again state. It's what we knew, darkness. Now we've been translated out of darkness into light. Light now is our na natural environment. Can you say amen? amen? So you struggle with stuff, nightmares, fear, intimidation, Condemnation. These are all realms of the dark realm where, where the enemy lives. You've been translated out of that into light. Don't believe the lie anymore. The world's the same. Next slide. We've been saved from this world. Jesus said you're of this world. Sorry, you're in this world, but not of this world. In other words, we still have a physical body. We still need to interact and we talk and we eat and work and still of this world, but we're not part of this world. <laughs> Why? Because of the gospel. So we don't make it about this world. We make it about our treasures in heaven. 
We make it about how many people we're going to bring into heaven with us. I wonder what your welcome in heaven's going to be like. With all the people you've sowed a seed to, you've prayed for, you've led to Christ. I want hundreds and thousands of people to welcome me into heaven. Can you say amen? <laughs> Why? Because we're not of this world. We're in this world, not of this world. Anyway, let's move on. The law. This is a big one as well. We've been set free from the curse of the law. <laughs> in other words, the law is a composite whole. In other words, if you break one commandment of the law, you're guilty of breaking all, hundred, all 631 of them. There's 631 in the Old Testament, commandments of the law. God's so serious about holiness that if you broke one, you're guilty of breaking all of them. And he's very clear about the, the curses that came upon his people who disobeyed the law. Death, miscarriages, and uh, stuff. Read in Deuteronomy 28. Curses of the law. Jesus became a curse for us that the blessing given to Abraham might come upon us. Can you say amen? So the curse has been broken. You know, when me and Maria got born again, our family bloodline curse was broken. Because we're the, my sister first, but then in our terms of our kids, the, the bloodline, the curse stopped when we became born again. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus' work on the cross is more powerful than the curse of sin that was characterized in our life. We're set free from the curse of the law. Now, Paul says, we follow the law, but not as an external written letter or code. We follow the law from obedience of our heart. We uphold the law from our heart, not because of an external regulation. Does that make sense? Because some people preach that we don't have to do the law anymore. You heard that? That we're so saved by grace, we never have to obey anymore. Well, how can you have a, a gospel without obedience? If you never obey the Lord, I question whether you're saved. And that's straight up honest. <laughs> and you can quote all the scriptures on grace all you like. But if you never say, Lord, I obey you because I love you, I don't know if you're born again. And I don't want to question your salvation. I'm just saying, let's be careful. Not everything you hear on YouTube and Facebook, gobble it up. Test it. Paul says, test the scriptures. Test the prophetic words. Test what's going on in people's lives. I'm not angry. Flesh, this is a big one. I'll finish with this. The Bible says we've been set free, that our sinful nature has been cut away, and we have no longer an obligation to follow the appetites of our flesh. Again, the enemy lies to think, well, you're just human, you're just male, you're just Italian, you're red-blooded. Sorry, Rock. <laughs> you're just Greek. <laughs> and we make excuses for our flesh. Well, that's just the way I am. It's my way or the highway. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. If Jesus has set you free, then he encourages us to walk in the Spirit. So we let go of the fleshly sinful nature and we walk in the Spirit by following our reborn spirit. Are we good? That's the gospel. Not that we make excuses for our sin, our flesh. We own it. If you mess up, own it. Pa uh, dads, if you mess up. Husbands, if you mess up, don't blame others. Don't blame your wife, especially. It's not going to get you anywhere. I'm joking. If you lose your temper... Say, I'm sorry, I lost my temper. Don't make excuses. If you tell a lie, 
Say, oh, sorry, I lied. <laughs> Repent. Are we good? This is all part of the gospel. This is all healthy discipleship. This is all declaring that Jesus is alive. He loves me so much that he's welcomed into his kingdom. But because he loves me so much, he wants me to be transformed to become more like his son, Jesus. So there's no more excuse. Turn to the person next to you say, no more excuses. <laughs> Either Jesus dealt with it on the cross, or he's helping you now to deal with it. Or one day in eternity, he'll finally deal with it. It's all part of the same gospel. Can you say amen? amen. Wonderful. Let's stand to our feet, please. We're going to pray. And if you need some ministry, I'd love to, the team here would love to pray for you. If we can have the last three slides up again, that'd be awesome. So this morning, we're going to conclude with just this prayer. The Bible says in Romans 2, don't you, uh, don't you show contempt for the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And this morning, you're here, you're watching on YouTube. There's a number that's going to come on your screen. And if you are watching on YouTube and this message has touched you, please send us some feedback. We'd love to connect with you. The Bible says that we need to admit, which is repent, turn away, change our heart and mind. Acts 2 says, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Spirit. This morning, Holy Spirit is leading you to repentance. If you know Jesus, then it's an ongoing work of surrender to Him. We repent by letting go of things in our lives. If you don't know Jesus, if Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, this morning the Holy Spirit is con possibly convicting you of the truth of the gospel. And His Holy Spirit is, is leading you to repentance this morning. Where well, you can say no to sin, no to self, turn away from things that you know that are wrong in your life. Because according to the next slide there, we believe the Bible says in Romans 10, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. This morning, as you turn away from yourself and your sin, I encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, to believe, to grab a hold of what Jesus did for you on the cross. The Holy Spirit can lead you into that truth this morning. That you can believe from the heart. And next, is you confess. Now, one lead us into a prayer. But as we heard earlier with Alessia, you can pray a prayer and confess the Lordship of Jesus anywhere you are. You don't have to be in a church building. You don't have to be around other believers for your salvation. You confess the Lordship of Christ. You confess to let go of sin, you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord. And the Bible says if we do those things, if we meet those three criteria, then we, beca we can become Christians, we become born again. I want to pray for us generally. If you've got more questions, we'd love to help you. If you and your seat are praying this prayer for the first time, I encourage you to come and reach out to us so we can help you. There's information on our website you can dig into. But Father, thank You for sending Your one and only Son that today we celebrate the resurrection of our King Jesus, that he's made, You have made Your life available to us, Lord. And today we celebrate You, but today we honour You by believing and trusting Your Word and putting our faith in Your finished work on the cross, Jesus. We believe You died for our sin, you rose again after three days. And today we want to confess you as our Lord. You're our King, you're our boss. We will obey you all the days of our life, Lord. But I pray today, the YouTube in this building, those who are ready to make that decision, Holy Spirit, that you will lead them to do that. Father, for the rest of us who know you, I pray even today that we just gripped with over, overwhelming sense of your love for us. 
your compassion for us, your goodness towards us. They'll be overflowing with love as we gather as families to celebrate Easter. The Lord, we will just reach out in love and faith to people around us to help them, to pray for them, to be there for them. We commit this day to you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the honour, all the blessing in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, feel free to come out for some prayer. Oh, we got some refreshments at the back, some fresh hot cross buns. God bless you. Thank you.